All right, let's take a look at our memory verse from Psalm 1. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. Good verse to memorize. Actually, it's a very good platform for the book of Psalms, as uh, King David gives us, reveals to us the choices that we can make as believers, and I think it's a good thing for us to uh, think about as we uh, hit that verse every week. And maybe at the end of the Psalm series, we'll all have a chance, and whoever can quote that without looking at it will get a prize. The prize will be discussed. Let's take our uh, hymn books. If you have one, if not, look up on the screen. Uh, hymn 33.
Actually, I shouldn't apologize. It's just a frailty of a minute. Take your Bibles, turn to Psalm 9 again. Rarely ever do this, but it needs to be done. We're going to start verse 12, though. Psalm 9, verse 12. Finish the chapter here. Verse 12, when he maketh inquisition for blood, he remembereth them, for he forgetteth not the cry of the humble. Have mercy upon me, O Lord, consider my trouble, which I suffer of them that hate me, thou that liftest me up from the gates of death, that I may show forth all thy praise in the gates of the daughter of Zion. I will rejoice in thy salvation, the heathen are sunk down in the pit that they made in the net which they hid is their own foot taken. The Lord is known by the judgment which he, which he executed. The wicked is snared in the work of his own hands, had Gion Selah. The wicked shall be turned into hell, and all the nations that forget God. For the needy shall not always be forgotten. The expectation of the poor shall not perish forever. Arise, O Lord, let not man prevail, let the heathen be judged in thy sight. Put them in fear, O Lord, that the nations may know themselves to be but men. The sea law. May God bless us with this passage of scripture. And uh, as we go to prayer this morning, let's continue to pray for uh, Janet's brother Carl. Just to let you know, uh, Janet is very sensitive to smells, and that's why she, she had to leave last Sunday smell of the, the stain. I was going to say progress, got her, but the stain is a good word too. Uh, you know, and uh, um, all right, so let's pray for a brother. Pray for Pastor Art and pray for this fellow Daniel that he got to witness to. Continue to pray for Keith and Elaine. Elaine is uh, lame today from um, whatever. You know, Elaine isn't healing correctly and something's going to have to happen with her. Uh, continue to pray for Walter in Brazil. Uh, pray for Raja Rani as well. Um, and uh, if you ever talk to them, try to encourage her. And uh, pray for Chris in England as well. If you continue to pray for my grandson Zachary, he's on his what week? Yeah. So he has 12 weeks in one cast, and then he's got another cast coming that he has to take. So it's very hard for him. He doesn't understand it. And, and, uh, so. Let's pray. Could you pray for Tony's um, um, uh, grandson, Nicholas? And yeah, he's having some troubles with schizophrenia. And uh, he's trying, Tony's trying to convince uh, his mother to take him to a Baptist church near where she lives. And maybe the pastor can help him, not uh, maybe suggest some place to go. Um, we can still continue to pray for the baby, Patty. That was um, hurt with the boy the team, made his friend, and uh, I think she's going to survive, but she had 20 to 30% burns on her body, which is quite a bit for a little baby. Um, continue to pray for, uh, I spell it wrong, but I, his name is Ray. Ray? Ray? Okay. And uh, anybody have a prayer request? Or did I miss it? Sometimes read my own handwriting. You pray for us. We're leaving today after church and heading out west for a little, little bit of uh, traveling and uh, visiting kids. And we'll be bringing back two of our grandchildren from Georgia um, in two weeks' time. Uh, so, if you need me, I have my cell phone. So just call me if I'm in a place where there's cell service. Of course, a part of our trip will be through part of a desert, which. The only cell towers you see in Cactus, so I'm not sure how it works down there, but anyway, we'll, we'll just call Keith and Keith and go home somehow. Anybody have a prayer request? How, you're asking how Raj is? Raj is okay. He saw him the other day. He's very lonely. It's between the doctor and his daughter, they, he, they won't let him out of the house you know, until they come up with a cure. If you were to go visit him, he would be glad to see somebody. 
just go on a back porch, you know, and sit in there, whatever, but keep spend some time with them. So just pray for him and Ronnie. Yes, direct. For Ben? Yeah. What's he's what? He's going to go over the front. Oh, okay. Roger and Ronnie, they were extremely happy just when I wandered in that day, but they, they really appreciate just somebody to say hello to them.
take your Bibles, turn to Psalm 9, please. Let's pray, Father, we're thankful for this time. We pray, Lord, as we embrace your word that hearts will be open to the Holy Spirit's uh, direction, that uh, we might be encouraged and, and, uh, and inspired, Father, to grow closer to you. We pray also, Father, for uh, just those that couldn't make it. We pray for Matt, suffering from arthritis, and uh, yesterday when I went to visit him, he was in a lot of pain in his neck and shoulders, and uh, we pray for Mary as well, who's having trouble with diarrhea, and uh, um, we just give the praise of Jesus. I probably shouldn't have said that, but um, I had it as well, and uh, I thought, you know, um, Friday I was really sick. I had hot dogs late. I got back from the golf course and made the mistake of eating two hot dogs at around 9 o'clock, and I suffered for it for the next whole day and a half, really. So, uh, but I never learned because I like hot dogs. The mustard got me, I guess. As you get older, I guess your systems get sensitive, maybe. Or they might have been bad hot dogs, who knows. <laughs> All right, I'm going to share something with you that I think that you're going to, I, I find it good because I'm going to give you an insight into my, my study. This is something that is not necessarily meant to be a message, but as I was doing my word study for the passage, it really kind of fell out because the concept of God's justice really kind of plays through in this chapter, both justice for the sinner and justice for the saint. And I thought because, you know, this is one of those things that I think maybe once in a while I should do because as you study the Bible as well, with just a simple uh, tool uh, with the language, you can kind of see what David was revealing. Justice is something that most of us understand, but when we hear it, we lean toward mercy. And I'll, I'll explain that in a minute. So justice of God is, is really a two-sided or two-edged sword, and perfect in its judgment and execution. We have to remind ourselves that because there has been in the last 20 years within the church a real softening of God's uh, punishment. I know a lot of believers that are hoping that at the end, God is just going to say, you know what, it's okay. Everybody's going to come in. And, uh, which really kind of dilutes God's sovereignty and will. God is going to judge sin because he's God. So justice means that someone that is guilty is going to the judge who is God is going to execute that judgment. So, anyway, let me start off with something a little lighter. Uh, and I think that you'll find it, it could be quite interesting. My computer is trying to update me. Let me try to stop this or I'm going to be in trouble. Stop this. Okay. Just as well, I have a Bible right here I can use. There's a young lady who occasionally walked through the park after work. And uh, uh, stopped to have her picture taken by a photographer on this particular day. Now it's dated because the photographer was using one of those Polaroids, remember? Um, which is quite fashionable now at weddings. There's Polaroids that people have and then you put on funny suits and get pictures for memories. Anyway. So she's walking through the woods and she's very excited about a picture being taken. And as she's walking out of the park, you know how it takes a little while for that Polaroid to come out. Um, she turned and headed back to the cameraman. And when she got there, she stated, this is not right. This is not right. You have done me no justice. And the photographer looked at the picture and looked at her and stated, miss, you don't need justice. What you need is mercy. Okay, good. I saw some smiling there. I thought it was funny, you know, and uh, justice is a serious topic. 
Because uh, God who is righteous and sinless and perfect cannot deal with unrighteousness or sin. And his uh, absolute character of justice requires him to deal with it. And David, uh, under the line of uh, the message I preached last week, revealed this in his passage. But I want to give you two examples from the New Testament, if you look up on the board. And uh, some of these titles for justice are descriptive in their mind. I mean, uh, it, it's descriptive in the way it is. Blessed is the man that endured temptation. For when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. So for the believer, there's this uh, re remu remunerative, uh, re what is it? Remunerative. It's, I should have picked an easier word, but, you know, sometimes in my, uh, whatever, you know, I know what it means. It's just hard to come out. But just as he distributes rewards, um, we have uh, another one there too. It should have been James. Did you have the James one? Okay, my secretary is going to have to be. Okay, okay, that's one of James. Okay, because James one twelve is a good one as well. Oh, okay. What's the next one? Second Timothy. Okay, henceforth there is a laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous Judge shall give me at that day, and not me to me only, but all of them that also love is appeared. Now, if you wanted to go farther with this concept, you'll see a key word of love there. Only those that are his love him. You know, you can say, you know, I love you. But uh, to be able to say that you love God, God has uh, adopted you as family, and that agape love, that love that we have for one another, uh, matter of fact, the New Testament church was known because they loved the brethren. And so uh, uh, what those two examples are just some, some of the verses that I looked at when I'm looking at this idea of righteousness. And we're going to look at first the justice for the sinner and then the justice for the saint in the last part. Two descriptive words come out. If you, if you go to verse 3 of Psalm 9. When, David says, when my enemies are turned back, they shall fall and perish at thy presence. So in my word study, I wrote the word dreadful. And you could have word, use any word kind of like that. Because uh, uh, when I saw that, Hebrews 10.31 came up. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. The... Uh, the unbeliever in the, in the Old Testament and the New Testament, those that reject God's presence, uh, ignore him, say he's dead, say he doesn't exist, or he says he's us and all sorts of different ideas, the atheist to the agnostic to the religious. Uh, those uh, concepts are uh, uh, what we see in society. If you share the gospel with enough people, you'll run into more of those than not, where they, you know, they want you to uh, uh, slow down a bit. In our postmodern church, a lot of pastors will preach a lot about how good God is, how loving He is, how wonderful He is, but will skip the part about how just He is. And I think it's necessary for understand because what I'm worried about, and I uh, could change that word not to worry but concerned about, and what Margaret and I pray for every day is for our grandchildren, that they might come to Christ at an early age. And for our children and our family members, because we love them and uh, know what's coming down the pipe for them. Wonderful people, good people, loving people, but lost. And uh, no amount of hope is going to change the justice of God. So uh, when we talk about it, it's a dreadful thing. It's a wrathful thing. Uh, there's a, and I'm not going to give you the word study, but you can... I'll give you the information in one. But in, in, in Scripture, God's strong and vigorous opposition to everything evil, there's a Greek verb that can be used both of anger and of the swelling of buds as the sap rises. It points to the kind of anger that results from a settled and consistent disposition and uh, not to a losing one of one's temper. God's wrath is like that. 
rather than like a human anger on a grand scale with us, wrath always has elements of passion, lack of self-control, and irrationality. The wrath of God does not. God's wrath is consistently always the same. It never changes because the end result is the judgment for the unrighteousness. Now, of course, you can't separate the unrighteousness from the unrighteous person or the lost person. So, you want to move that speaker? You just like that. Okay, you can make faces at me and I can't see it. Okay, I see that. So look at verse 5 and 8, 5 through 8. Thou hast rebuked the heathen. Thou hast destroyed the wicked. Thou hast put out their name forever. So we have, in a nutshell here, destructive justice, and that's the label I gave. It's not inspired, but it kind of describes this. God is going to remove them. One day, in glory, all unrighteousness will be gone. Uh, now, uh, someone suggested in one of my uh, uh, commentaries, using the idea that they'll be annihilated, but that misleads many, because there are some groups that believe that we are alive, and then we're totally gone. That's not true. The unsaved person that dies will spend eternity in the lake of fire, consciously suffering for eternity. So uh, now, that is an inspiring thing for me to go beyond the uh, comfort zone of my life to try to tell those that I have in contact with of what's coming down the pipe. Now in evangelism, a lot of times evangelists and pastors will use the idea of the dike. You know, the, the, if we lived by a big dam and when you knew it was going to go in the next 15 minutes, you would go to everybody's house and warn them whether you liked them or not. And uh, then, of course, the people have to make a decision to believe you or not, obviously. And that's in its most elementary form, but that's kind of what we do as believers. We have this gospel message and we, we carry it to those that God brings in our life trying to share with them that there's an option, there's forgiveness, and there's a way to uh, uh, be uh, saved from the impending doom. It all sounds kind of rough and terrible, but this is what justice is. God is going to mete out this justice, uh, and he's not, a, uh, he's not going to select certain ones for different punishments. Unrighteousness will be punished. And David says that this punishment is uh, uh, not only destructive, but eternal. Verse 7, it says, But the Lord shall endure forever. He hath prepared his throne for judgment. And uh, Psalm 92 says, Before the mountains were brought forth, forever you had formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you, thou art God. When we think about his eternal justice, just as we will be thinking about the eternal bliss that we'll celebrate as believers, we have to think this way as well as we look at those that are lost in their sins and uh, make a plan to be able to at least plant the seed in their heart. Uh, it's not a temporary justice, it's a, it, and God is not a temporary God. Our God is an everlasting, indestructible, unconquerable God. And that's the God that David worshipped in his time. All around him were people that were worshipping pagan gods and horrific gods that were uh, based behind or based by uh, uh, religion that really embraced something else than God. And Jesus says in the New Testament, your father is either God or the devil. So really there's only two options for mankind regardless of what they call their God and mythology or whatever. Satan is behind that part of it. And David had to deal with that on a regular basis. But he reveals something about uh, not only destructive justice and eternal justice, but there's a perfect justice in verse 8. And he shall judge the world in righteousness. He shall minister judgment to the people in uprightness. And uh, we find that in Romans chapter 2, it says, I think we have that right. But after thy hardness and impotent heart, treasure up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to every man according to his deeds. I think that's all I have. Okay. So we have perfect justice. We, 
We, uh, righteousness is a perfect standard. And when you think about God, that's where we have to go. That God is perfect and right and straight. Matter of fact, the Hebrew word for justice means straight. And uh, we find that God is going to uh, deal or judge mankind for their unrighteousness. It's flawless, it's holy, and it'll always be right. Perfect and equitable. So lastly, we have uh, punishment. Uh, that's found in verses 15 and 17. The heathen are sunk down in the pit that they have made. In the net which they uh, hid is their own foot taken. The Lord is known by the judgment which he executed. The wicked is snared in the work of his own hands. And it has the pig gaion see law. The wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. So there's a consistency in God's judgment that only those that are his, those that embrace the gospel, those that place their faith in God's program in the Old Testament will be spared from the righteous judgment, the just judgment that God will deliver on mankind. There's a guy named Mr. Thomas. He was a missionary uh, in Singapore and was, uh, uh, not Singapore, Sir Sirampur, which is in India, I think. And after addressing a crowd of uh, indigenous people there on the banks of the Ganges, he was accosted by a Brahmin. And, and this is what the conversation follows. Sir, don't you say that the devil tempts men to sin? Answered Mr. Thomas. Then said the Brahmin, certainly the fault is the devil's. The devil, therefore, and not man ought to suffer punishment. While the countenance of many of the indigenous uh, people uh, disclosed their apparition of uh, the Brahmin's interference or inference, Mr. Thomas observed a boat with several men on board descending the river. And with that faculty of instructive retort for which he was uh, so distinguished, he replied, Brahmin, do you see yonder boat? Yes. Suppose I were to send some of my friends to destroy every person on boat and bring me all that is valuable to the boat. Who ought to suffer punishment? He said, I for instructing them or they for doing the wicked act. Why, answered the Brahmin with emotion, you ought to be put to death together. And he said, uh, right so, Brahmin, replied Mr. Thomas, and if you and the devil sin together, the devil and you will be punished together. His name was Saints back from the 1800s. Well, what he was saying was that uh, sin is going to be punished and there's no one to blame. Remember, uh, what's his name? You say the devil made me do it. Uh, whatever that guy was. What was his name? Yeah, Flip Wilson, that's it. And uh, that became a popular statement. And I've heard people, even within Christendom, uh, mostly in the charismatic group, will say, well, it's not really my sin. It's a demon of lust or deeming of whatever sitting on my shoulders, making me sin. But the Bible is very clear that we're all guilty and we all have to pay the price. Thank God that the Lord Jesus Christ came and paid the price for our sins in totality. And so that's the message that we have to the world. There is coming a day when man will be judged. The Bible says every knee shall bow. David brings out that no one will escape. The punishment is there. The uh, certainty and the consistency is there. Uh, he brings out this idea of self-condemned justice. I read that in verse 15 and 16. It's one thing to have a question of guilt. It's another thing to be caught red-handed. The traps the world sets for us are very ones that are caught in. You know, there's sometimes where uh, the Proverbs talk about beware of the uh, trap of the of the woman, and uh, I, I, I should have wrote it down, but to be aware of the subtlety of Satan and how he tries to trick us, trick us up. You know, he'll attack your weak link, etc. So, but there's this idea, though, as believers especially, that we we hide behind a cross. The Lord Jesus has taken care of our sins, and because of the Holy Spirit inside us, we can actually strengthen our faith and our walk so that we can. Be aware of the traps and avoid them. Why do you want to avoid sin as a believer? You're going to go to heaven. I've had that question asked me. My sins are forgiven, so what's the deal? And that's the wrong question to ask because of what Christ has done for us, becoming new creations. We have a new nature. 
And the evidence of that new nature is a desire to please Him and to sin less. None of us are going to be perfect, but there should be within you a desire to please God and to uh, avoid the sin that so easily besets us. He uh, coins the phrase, but you know, all of us are different. Some of us have a propensity to lie or to gossip or to steal or to lust or something like that. And as believers now, uh, we still have the urge, but we can say no because of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a wonderful freedom to fall into the hands of a loving God, a God that loves us. And as we say, Lord, help me in this area, he will. And, but there has to be a fight on our side to say no to sin. Now, you know, I'm going to switch gears here because it gets better now. It's a terrible thing to think about because this final justice is hell, verse 17, for the Christ-rejecting godless world. And uh, all those who have shaken their fist at the face of God. Have you ever been in presence where someone that, if God is real, strike him dead? I always would take a step back just in case, because he could if he wanted to, but he's not going to prove himself to them. Uh, he's, his, uh, his presence is among us as we look. And uh, our job is to share that truth with them. And, of course, the Holy Spirit has his ministry with those that uh, come to Christ and uh, reveals the sin in their hearts. But it's unavoidable. Uh, this justice, unobstructed justice, is found in verse 19. Arise, O Lord, let not man prevail. Let the heathen be just in thy sight. It's sovereign justice as well. Put them in fear, O Yahweh, that the nations may know themselves to be but men. See, law. There are a lot of arrogant people today that think that they are gods. They have a handle on it. They, they act like they're above everybody else. And... Uh, uh, you know, the Bible says God hates a proud look. Uh, that arrogance one day will be judged. Uh, those of us who are believers today, we come before the Lord in humility because we know where we were headed and now we're going to glory. What a wonderful thing to think about. One day we'll be in heaven. I won't make any more mistakes. Well, you won't have anything to laugh at. You know, but we'll be in a sin sin-free environment with the Savior on the throne for a thousand years and then who knows what's going to happen after that. But uh, we don't know where we're going. We might never come back from this trip. You never know. Uh, the Lord might take us home. I don't think we're going to be that lucky. But, uh, you know, one of those things that we can relish, it's not something that's saying that we're suicidal, but that's the reward that we're waiting for. One day we'll be in His presence. Okay, let's talk about justice for the saint. And let's go back to verse 4. And then uh, you'll have a thorough understanding of verse 9 from David. For thou hast maintained my right and my cause. Thou uh, sadest in the throne judging right. Uh, the word sadist has the idea of... Uh, uh, wait, let me think about it for a second. Let me, matter of fact, just do a little thing here. And I should have wrote it down. Yeshada is the Hebrew word, has the idea to dwell, remain, uh, sit, be sent, to uh, have one's abode. And so the idea that God is not going to uh, remove himself from the throne of judging correctly now, or righteously, or judging us according to the blood of the Lamb. Uh, when you get to heaven, uh, you're going to be ushered into his presence. And uh, 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 the the blood of the Lamb has washed us clean. And I, I believe that Jesus will be the first one we'll see. And he'll know us by our name. What a wonderful thing to think about. Uh, when you get discouraged and uh, disappointed in life and wonder about the future, dwell on the fact that one day we'll be in his presence for eternity. And uh, how long have you ever had, uh, how long have you ever been happy? You know, having that joy. How long did it last for you? Did you ever have an, at least an hour of joy where you were totally happy or was a euphoric feeling that lasted for a few moments and that kind of dissipated? Imagine being euphoric for eternity with sanity, of course, and rationality and worshiping God and all its, uh, all its greatness in heaven. There's no way to put words to describe what we're going to be, but we find ourselves first looking at uh, God's justice in a defensive mode. Uh, 
Psalm 140, 12, I know that the Lord will maintain the cause of the afflicted and justice and and right or justice or uh, righteousness of the poor. It's interchangeable, the, the Hebrew word. Sometimes it's translated right, righteousness, just. And it's a wonderful thing that God is there for us. Now, we've been cheated in the past. God, a man has cheated us and taken us and sometimes taken our money, sometimes uh, uh, taken our positions and all that. Yet the Bible reminds us, though, that God is the God of vengeance as well. Nothing will escape God. God will be righteous and just at the right time. So even though we find ourselves sometimes in a position where we have lost something for no fault of our own or because of our relationship with God, God is aware of that. That falls even within the defensive part. But there is this idea that as long as God is on the throne, we, we fear no threat from false accusations. Now, you can be called anything in the book here, but God knows the truth. And that's where we stand on. My last church, I had a deacon turn on me. Pretty much said everything about me uh, that he could think of. Filthy lucre, uh, all the different things that are uh, popular sins. He, he blamed me. Uh, because I wouldn't do what he told me to do. And what do you do? You can't say I'm not guilty because, you know, people are always wondering. And the only thing that gave me sanity to keep me there was I know that God knows what's right. God knows my heart. And uh, that was the only thing that kept me going because it affected me, you know, physically and emotionally because I've never experienced that before. And I don't want to ever again. I hate that, but it could happen again. You never know. You know, you share the gospel or try to encourage someone and they're the wrong type, they can really do a number on you. Because, uh, you know, if you notice that Christians aren't well liked in our country anymore. Matter of fact, uh, the, there's one side of our country that's trying to remove God from everything. And they've done quite a bit of a job, you know. Now they're trying to remove history as well. And, uh, you know, here we are standing here. Uh, trusting God, hoping for the best. Now, let me remind you, if you know Christ is your Savior, even though you haven't experienced any kind of real persecution in your life, you will. Somewhere along the line, you're going to have to make a decision, make a stand for Christ. And, uh, you know, this is not something to be feared of because of what David says. David says that he's always there. He's defending us. He's attentive. Look at verse 9. We have this a protective justice. The Lord also will be a refuge for the oppressed, a refuge in times of trouble. David knew about that. He experienced that in the caves as Absalom was chasing him. But let me explain this to you a little better for us. Uh, sometimes we're going to go through difficult times and God is going to be our refuge. We'll still be involved and the problems will still be there. But God will give us that refuge in our hearts, in our minds, knowing that he's in complete control. When we go through difficult times, you have to decide, is it because of God or me? Is God trying to teach me something? Or is God using my experience to teach someone else something? Job had the same problem. Job suffered greatly, lost everything. And he was a righteous man. He was a good guy. But God was not only teaching us, but revealed to him later that this was all to prove that uh, his, his faith in God was true. And he wouldn't curse God and die, even after his wife asked him to do that. So we, we see this throughout the scriptures. But justice for the same is defensive, attentive. It's abiding justice. Look at verse 10. And they that know thy name will put their trust in thee. What a song that is. You know, Christ is your Savior. You're placing your trust in Him. For thou art Yahweh, thou art God, the Lord, has not forsaken them that seek thee. It's never a waste of time to spend time in God's Word, to share the Gospel, to share the love of Christ through activities, and to pray for people. Sometimes we're so busy, we don't have time for things that the Lord says are should be the priority of our lives. And uh, praying is the number one thing I suggest for each believer. Everything you do will be enhanced if we spend time in personal prayer, seeking his face. Uh, it's a wonderful thing. 
to be able to spend time alone, shut the cell phone off, shut the TV off, uh, find yourself a place by yourself, and open your heart to God. It's a ministering thing. It's medicinal as well, as far as making you feel bathed in His grace. It's a wonderful feeling. It's not a charismatic thing or nothing. It's just one of those things that God gives us as a benefit to be able to have His presence with us. And it's a wonderful thing. Well, there's the abiding justice, 2 Timothy 1.12. Do we have that one yet? I'll just leave it up there. Uh, he's an everlasting, he's everlastingly dependable. That's a very expressive uh, phrase. I'm trying to come up with something a little less, but um, could have said eternal. But everlastingly dependable. How do you look at that? God is not going to let you down, ever. He's never going to forsake you or walk away from you. And remember that. He will never abandon us, no matter how bleak the situation. First Timothy 1.12 For the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I'm not ashamed, for I know whom I believe, and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. What a wonderful statement that the, uh, Paul talks to Timothy about. And uh, uh, notice that the uh, cause I also suffer these things. And uh, as believers, uh, somewhere along the line, we are going to suffer. And uh, we all suffer physical ailments and d disappointments, but if you exercise your faith and share the gospel, somewhere along the line, it's gonna come back at you. But instead of being discouraged, do what the disciples did when they were in the jail, chained to these big guards. Instead of feeling sorry for themselves because they were captive, they were celebrating, they were worshiping, they were singing. Try that on precise. Instead of, well, woe is me. Why did God cause me to have this problem? Why do I feel so bad? Why can't I do what I used to do? I'm getting old. Nobody wants to listen to me. Hey. I like Keith's idea. Lose an ear and aid. You don't hear half the problems in that life, right? You know, don't let anything bother you. Filter it all through God's promises that God is there for us. Okay, let's go on from there. Uh, there's praiseworthy justice, verse 11. Sing praises to the Lord, which dwell in Zion. Declare among the people his doings. David was telling us that this is what his, his lifestyle was that he rejoiced to the point where he could not hold it in. And he shared this. He does it in the psalm here as well. And for us, when you get overwhelmed by God's blessings, the only thing you really can do is share with other people how good God is. Try that a few times to your unsaved friends. And then share what God, how good God is to you and what he has done for you. They'll be amazed. They might think you're nuts, but hey, that might open a door for you to share. Maybe they, that's what they need as well. A lot of times God is dealing with unsaved people that we don't know about, and they've been shared the gospel before. Some people have planted the seeds of water, and we might be a part of that, and usually that's our function. Planting or watering, and God gives the increase. And so when God opens a door, then uh, start with that, sharing about how great God is and how wonderful he is to your life. You know, if you're going to sell a, 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 a hammer, you might want to use it. You know, you might share from your own experience how great this hammer is. It never misses a nail. Imagine how much a hammer like that would cost. My grandfather tried to teach me to hammer nails and when I was a kid, and he told me to go play baseball. I just couldn't hit it. I need a head about that big. But that's the way it is. But the gospel is just that. That, that, uh, Good news that wonderfully saved you. That's all we do is regurgitate back to the person. We don't have to try to convince them. We don't have to use fancy words. We don't have to dumb it down. We don't have to delude it. We share it at face value. The Word of God direct from the Bible. Don't worry about whether they believe it or not. Don't worry about whether they're offended or not because I've been known to them, the seed is planted in their heart. And some people that you thought would never have come to Christ have come to Christ. There's a guy in the New Testament that hated the church, that was hunting them down, and he thought he was doing God's will until Paul Saul met Jesus on the road to Damascus and became Paul and became 
a 300, is it 360? 360 change man. I remember telling uh, uh, Andy, remember Andy, the Italian guy? I said, Andy, the only thing you can do about your neighbor is pray for her. If you can win her to Christ, she'll be your best friend, a good neighbor again, you know? And he used to scratch his head because they did horrific things to his car and his property to the point where he had cameras up and everything, you know? He just was harassed, and I'm not sure why. But anyway, that's our recourse as believers. We might not be able to do anything that will change their mind, but we have the Holy Spirit and God's Word that can do a number on the person. And that's a hope that we have as believers, sharing the gospel. Uh, you know, it's uh, not only uh, praiseworthy and cantering. Uh, verse 12 says, when he makes inquisition for blood, he remembers them. He forgets not the cry of the humble. Every time you cried out to him, he knows. Now, his answer might not be immediate. Remember that. But his answer is there as well. Just as well. His answer is according to his righteous judgment. And uh, we have to be willing to trust him. And uh, uh, accept whatever his answer is. Silence sometimes is his answer for the, for the time being. And uh, um, I, sometimes that's very difficult to take. There's a young girl once prayed, bless my mommy and daddy. And dear God, take good care of yourself. If anything happens to you, we're sunk. The little kid. But uh, a lot of theology in that, because we're trusting God for everything. And that's why his Bible reveals to us his eternality, his, his dependability, his, his unchanging character, that he's so consistent that we can trust him uh, for everything, anytime. Well, we have uh, merciful justice in verse 13. Have mercy upon me, O Lord. Consider my whole trouble, which I suffer of them that hate me. Thou that liftest me up from the gates of death. David, at some points in his life, was uh, in, in, in desperate peril. And his uh, son Absalom and people that hated him. Now, David was the one that was, uh, was anointed king. God anointed him. He had that truth. Yet that truth didn't matter to those that hated David. Look at what happened to David and Saul. And uh, David, Saul realized what was happening and tried to kill David with a spear. And uh, so we, uh, I have this funny story that I might have shared with you, but I can't remember, so I guess it's okay. Uh, one time I was working in Dad's shop, and I was working on a Ford Taurus, trying to get the steering gear out. And I slipped with my wrench and banged my hand, and I was over there, oh, you know. And Dad was in the other pit. Uh, doing some kind of raising with a torch and started laughing at me and actually caught his shirt on fire. And I said, you never laugh at the anointing. <laughs> you know, I was just making a joy, jo a joke out of it. But what I'm looking at here is this is exactly what happens. Those that are humble, those that trust him, those that suffer, he remembers them. He never forgets the cry of the humble. Uh, and then we have provisional justice in verse 18. For the needy shall not always be forgotten. The expectation of the poor shall not perish forever. See, we see on this side of the equation as believers, his justice to us is good because of the blood of Christ. He's going to mete out this uh, justice, his righteousness in our lives. So that even though we're suffering, his righteousness will be there for us. In his memory, in his awareness, which is a good thing to know. I, I can suffer if I know that God is aware and is okay with it. Because if he's okay with it, then it must be good for me even though I don't enjoy it. That's kind of an attitude that we have to take as believers. Because uh, every hear this phrase was a song. I never promise you a rose garden. Sometimes in the enthusiasm of trying to win people to Christ, people will say things like, all your problems will be solved when you come to Christ. Everything will go your way now. It's not long after the person, if he truly comes to Christ, realizes that that was bad theology. Matter of fact, everything has gone wrong. All my friends hate me. I lost my job. You know, God has redirected my path. I was once going to be rich. Now I'm going to be a missionary or a pastor. You know, and, uh, you know, so, but God's will is perfect for us. 
And not in God's, not in man's standard to the world's standards. Remember the Bible says, we're just passing through. We're just kind of like sojourners. You know, we're campers. We're on the Appalachian Trail. You're not going to carry your toilet, which would be convenient, you know, in your sink and an air conditioner if it's hot. No, you're going bare minimum because that's all you need to get to point A to point B. Matter of fact, the less you carry, the easier it is. And uh, that's a good illustration for us as believers to avoid the baggage that we kind of pick up sometimes. You know, we, we hold grudges, we uh, refuse to forgive, and it could be a horrific thing, but really, because of what Christ has done for us, we have to do the same. His disciples said, how many times am I supposed to forgive this guy? You know, and Jesus gave an outstanding answer. You know, 100 times 100. Every time, really, is what he was saying. You should forgive because of what Christ has done for us. Uh, and um, I think I'm getting, yeah, I'm getting closer. Psalm 37, 25. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. You know, when it says that he'll meet our need, it's always, I always try to bring this up. It can be applied both ways, but our single most uh, important need is salvation. Everything else is great, but once you're saved, once you have your sins forgiven, then there is this progressive walk toward Him as we walk this life, uh, learning from His Word, to obey His Word and apply it, and Every time something grievous comes, we fall back into his hands, knowing that his promises are there. Even the, the young and now am old, yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. Psalm 37 uh, is a wonderful verse that I think is applicable to us. That, uh, and you probably, if I, we had the time, you could stand up and say, it's true. God provided for us. Uh, we lost this. We needed this. We, I, one time, with five kids in a house, lost my job and had no prospects and uh, no money and had bills. And uh, God wonderfully gave me work and eventually I found another work. But in the meantime, God provided for us and uh, uh, paid our bills, right? It's just like, it, to this day, I scratch my head. I did an intro. I didn't, I did a, I filled a pulpit for a church in Ticonderoga for about a year until they found a guy. And I went down every Sunday and, uh, you know, I had permission from the church that I was working at. And that was it. And they found the guy and it was fine. They offered me the church, but I didn't feel it was the right time. We were still young with ABWE. But I don't know how they found out, but one day they showed up with me. It's like, wow. You, you couldn't ask, how did you know? That's a convincing testimony. You share that with the unbelievers. Now, God has miraculously provided for you. And with no explanation, how, how this all fell into place. And it's a wonderful thing to fall in the hands of a loving God for us as believers. There's a provision of eternal vigilance his provision of final and eternal rest and life with Him. When you feel like life is out of control and unfair, when you feel like evil men are winning and you are losing, remember this psalm, Psalm 9. Yeah, they're, they're, they're going to win. Atifa, all these people that are trying to change our country to something else. And they don't care about you. They don't care about anything but their own agenda. And they might seem like they're winning. And, uh, you know, we have this COVID-19, what, what, what we have COVID-20 20 and 21 and 23. You know, all these things are oppressive and they can work on you. But this psalm tells us that God's righteousness will take care of the evil in the world and the evil man. And God's saints will be taken care of by his righteous judgment and his love for his own. The only thing we're left with, with is this, uh, this uh, problem how to take the word of God to that person that does not want to hear it. And that goes back to what I started to do. We need to spend time in prayer, praying for these people. It's an impossibility to reach them sometimes. 
especially if they've gone through college and they've been programmed into thinking that there's no God. And every college out there has the same agenda, except maybe the Bible colleges, you know, and uh, they've been programmed in evolution. And it just happened by a big bang, you know. And we're coming with what they would think is, you know, old-fashioned religion, and it's for the weak. But it's the, it's the living Word of God. And uh, we have uh, confidence in it. Based on what God has done for us, we can do for someone else. Share the gospel with them. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we're thankful for this time. Uh, thank you, Father, for uh, your word and for your justice. Help us to remind ourselves that those that we love that aren't saved need to hear the gospel. And uh, or if they don't come to Christ, one day they're going to face the judge and uh, spend eternity in the lake of fire. Thank you for my salvation, for loving me. I didn't deserve it. And uh, all of us probably would admit that there's nothing within us that was worthy for it. But we we're thankful that someone took the time to share the gospel with each one of us. And your Holy Spirit ministered to us, Father, and that's what we want for others. Give us opportunities to share the gospel in the coming days. And we just give you the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's uh, sing one more hymn together. M44, or him that's up on the screen. He thou is
loving Father, how we thank you that this very day we can trust in our Lord Jesus Christ to die and direct our path and watch over us and keep us safe. May you, Father, guide us now and be in this place. Use us to your glory this day. And Father, our lives will be counted worthy. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, and we may be praised.